Chapter 15 Return to the Battle Ross lay listening to the even breathing from across the cabin. He had awakened in that quick transference from sleep to consciousness which was always his when on duty, but he made no attempt to move. Ash was still sleeping. Ash, whom he thought or had thought he knew as well as one man could ever know another, who had taken the place of family for Ross Murdoch the loner. Years, two, four of them now since he had made half of that partnership. His head turned, though he could not see that lean body, that quiet, controlled face. Ash still looked the same, but Ross's sense of loss was hurt and anger mingled. What had they done to Gordon, those three? Bewitched. Tales Terrence had accepted as purest fantasy for centuries came into his mind. Could it be that his own world once had its Foana? Ross scowled. You couldn't refute their magic. Call it by what scientific name you wished. Hypnotism. Teleporting. They got results, and the results were impressive. Now he remembered the warning the Foana themselves had delivered hours earlier to the rovers. There were limits to their abilities. Because they were forced to draw on mental and physical energy, they could be exhausted. Thus, they had barriers, too. Again Ross considered the subject of barriers. Carrara had been able to meet the aliens, if not mind to mind, then in a closer way even than Ash. The talent which tied her to the dolphins had in turn been a bond with the Foana. Ash and Carrara could enter that circle, but not Ross Murdoch. Along with his new separation from Ash came that feeling of inferiority to bite on, and the taste was sour. This isn't going to be easy. So Ash was awake. What can they do? Ross asked in return. I don't know. I don't believe that they can teleport an army into Baldi headquarters the way Torgal expects. And it wouldn't do such an army much good to get there and then be outclassed by the weapons the Baldis might have, Ash said. Ross had a moment of warmth and comfort. He knew that tone of old. Ash was studying the problem, willing to talk out difficulties as he always had before. No, outright assault isn't the answer. We'll have to know more about the enemy. One thing puzzles me. Why have the Baldies suddenly stepped up their timing? What makes you think they have? You mean such things as those attractors set up on the reef at Zahor's castle? Ross remembered Lokith's story those, and other things. The refinements added to the engine power on these ships. Torgal said they spread from rover fleet to fleet. No one's sure where they started. The Baldies began slowly, but they are speeding up now. Those fairing attacks have all been recent. And this assault on the Foana Citadel blew up almost overnight on a flimsy excuse. Why the quick push after the slow beginning? Maybe they decided the natives are easy pushovers and they no longer have to worry about any real opposition, Ross suggested. Could be. Self-confidence becoming arrogance when they didn't uncover any opponent strong enough to matter. Or else, they may be spurred by some need with a time limit. If we knew the reason for those pylons, we might guess their motives. Are you going to try to change the future? That sounds arrogant, too. Can we if we wish to? We never dared to try it on Terra. And the risk may be worse than all our fears. Also, the choice is not ours. There's one thing I don't understand, Ross said. Why did the Foana walk out of the Citadel and leave it undefended for their enemies? What about their guards? Did they just leave them too? He was willing to make the most of any flaw in the alien's character. Most of their people had already escaped through underground ways. The rest left when they knew the cutters had been sunk, Ash returned. As to why they deserted the Citadel, I don't know. The decision was theirs. There, up with the barrier between them again. But Ross refused to accept the cutoff this time, determined to pull Ash back into the familiar world of the here and now. That keep could be a trap, about the best on this planet. 
The idea was more than just a gambit to attract Ash's attention, it was true. A perfect trap to catch baldies. Don't you see, Ross sat up, slapped his feet down on the deck as he leaned forward eagerly. Don't you see, if the baldies know anything at all about the Foana, and I'm betting they do and want to learn all they can, they'll visit the Citadel. They won't want to depend on second and third hand reports of the place, especially ones delivered by primitives such as the Wreckers. They had a sub there. I'll bet the crew are in picking over the loot right now. If that's what they're hunting, there was amusement in Ash's tone, they won't find much. The Foana have better locks than their enemies have keys. You heard inland before we left, any secrets left will remain secrets. But there's bait, bait for a trap, argued Ross. You're right. To the younger man's joy, Ash's enthusiasm was plain. The trap could net bigger catch than just underlings. Ross's thought matched Ash's. Why, it might even pull in the VIP directing the whole operation. How can we set it up, and do we have time? The trap would have to be a foe on a setting. Our part would come after it was sprung. Ash was thoughtful again. But it is the only move which we can make at present with any hope of success. And it will only work if the Foana are willing. Have to be done quickly, Ross pointed out. Yes, I'll see. Ash was a dark figure against the thin light of the companionway as he slid back the cabin door. If Yinvalda agrees. As he went out, Ross was right behind him. The Foana had been given, by their own choice, quarters on the bow deck of the cruiser where sailcloth had been used to form a tent. Not that any of the ostrich and rovers would venture too near them. Ash reached for the flap of the fabric and a lilting voice called, You seek us, Gordun? This is important. Yes, it is important, for the thought which brings you both has merit. Enter then, brothers. The flap was looped aside and before them was a swirling of mist? Light? Sheets of pale color? Ross could not have described what he saw. Save if the Foana were there, he could not distinguish them from the rippling of their hair, the melting film of their robes. So, younger brother, you think that which was our home and our treasure box has now become a trap for the confounding of those who believe we are a threat to them? Somehow Ross was not surprised that they knew about his idea before he had said a word, before Ash had given any explanations. Their omniscience was only a small portion of their other talents. Yes. And why do you believe so? We swear to you that the coast folk cannot be driven into those parts of the castle which mean the most, any more than our sea gate can be breached unless we will it so. Yet I swam through the sea gate, and the sub was there also. Ross knew again a flash of, was it pleasure? At being able to state this fact. There were chinks in the Foana defenses. Again the truth. You have that within you, young brother, which is both a lack and a shield. True also that this Indersea's ship entered after you. Perhaps it has a shield as part of it. Perhaps those from the stars have their own protection. But they cannot reach the heart of what they wish, not unless we open the doors for them. It is your belief, younger brother, that they still strive to force such doors? Yes. Knowing there is something to be learned, they will try for it. They will not dare not to. Ross was very certain on that point. His encounters with the Baldies had not led to any real understanding. But the way they had wiped out the line of Russian time stations made him sure that they dealt thoroughly with any situation they considered a threat. From the prisoners taken at KYN ad they had learned the invaders believed the Foana their enemies here. Even though the old ones had not repulsed them or their activities. Therefore, it followed that, having taken the stronghold, the Baldies would endeavor to rip open every one of its secrets. Ross wondered which one of the Foana said that. To see nothing but the swirls of mist color, listen to disembodied voices from it, was disconcerting. 
part of the stage dressing, he decided, for building their prestige with the other races with whom they dealt. Three women alone would have to buttress their authority with such trappings. Ah, younger brother, indeed you are beginning to understand us. Laughter, soft, but unmistakable. Ross frowned. He did not feel the touch-go touch of mental communication which the dolphins used. But he did not doubt that the Foana read his thoughts, or at least a few of them. Some of them, echoed from the mist. Not all. Not as your older brothers or the maiden whose mind meets with ours. With you, younger brother, it is a thought here, a thought there, and only our intuition to connect them into a pattern. But now, there is serious planning to be done. And, knowing this enemy, you believe they will come to search for what they cannot find. So you would set a trap. But they have weapons beyond your weapons, have they not, younger brother? Brave as are these rover kind, they cannot use swords against flame, their hands against a killer who may stand apart and slay. What remains, Gordun? What remains in our favor? You have your weapons, too, Ash answered. Yes, we have our weapons, but long have they been used only in one pattern, and they are A-T-U-N-E-D to another race. Did our defenses hold against you, Gordun, when you strove to prove that you were as you claimed to be? And did another repulse younger brother when he dared the Seagate? So can we trust them in turn against these other strangers with different brains? Only at the testing shall we know, and in such learning perhaps we shall also be forced to eat the sourness of defeat. To risk all may be to lose all. That may be true, Ash assented. You mean the sight you have had into our future says that this happens? Yes, to stake all and to lose, not only for ourselves, but for all others here. That is a weighty decision to make, Gordon. But the trap promises. Let us think on it for a space. Do you also consult with the rovers if they wish to take part in what may be desperate folly? Torgal paced the afterdeck, well away from the tent which sheltered the Foana. But with his eyes turning to it as Ross explained what might be a good attack. Those women killers would have no fear of Foana magic, rather would they come to seek it out. It would be a chance to catch leaders in a trap? You have heard what the prisoners said or thought. With what? Torgal demanded. I am not Ongol to argue that it is better to die in pursuit of blood payment than to take an enemy or enemies with me. What chance have we against their powers? Ask that of them. Ross nodded toward the still silent tent. Even as he spoke the three cloaked Foana emerged pacing down to midship where Torgal and his lieutenants, Ross and Ash came to meet them. We have thought on this. The lilting half-chant which the Foana used for ordinary communication was a song in the dawn wind. It was in our minds to retreat, to wait out this troubling of the land, since we are few and that which we hold within us is worth the guarding. But now, what profit such guardianship when there may be none to whom we may pass it after us? And if you have seen the truth, elder brother, the cowled head swung to ash, then there may be no future for any of us. But still there are our limitations. Rover, now they spoke directly to Torgal. We cannot put your men within the citadel by desiring, not without certain aids which lie sealed there now. No. We, ourselves, must win inside bodily and then. Then, perhaps, we can pull tight the lines of our net. To run a cruiser through the gate, Torgal began. No, not a ship, Captain. A handful of warriors in the water can risk the gate, but not a ship. Ash broke in. How many gill packs do we have? Ross counted hurriedly. I left one cached ashore. To pass the gates, that was the Foana, we ourselves shall not need your underwater aids. For Carrara, both the Terrans looked around. The Polynesian girl stood close to the Foana, smiling faintly. This venture is mine also, she spoke with conviction. 
as it is Tino Rouse and Taoise. Is that not so, daughters of the Ali of this world? Yes, sea maid. There are weapons of many sorts, and not all of them fit into a warrior's hand or can be swung with the force of a man's arm and shoulder. Yes, this venture is yours, also, sister. Ross's protests bubbled and spoken. He had to accept the finality of the Foana decree. It seemed now that the makeup of their task force depended upon the whims of the three rather than the experience of those trained to such risks. And Ash was apparently willing to accept their leadership. So it was an odd company that took to the water just as dawn colored the sky. Lokith had clung fiercely to his pack, insisted that he be one of the swimmers, and the Foana accepted him as well. Ross and Ash, Lokith, and Baleku, a young under-officer of Ongols, accorded the best swimmer of the fleet, Karara and the Dolphins. And with them those three others, shapes sliding smoothly through the water, as difficult to define in this new element as they had been in their tent. Before them frisked the dolphins. Tino, Rao and Tawa played about the Foana in an ecstatic joy and when all were in the sea they shot off shoreward. That sub within the sea gate, had it unleashed the same lethal broadcast as the one at KYN had? But the dolphins could give warning if that were so. Ra swam easily, Ash next, Lokith on his left, Baleku a little behind and Karara to the fore as if in vain pursuit of the dolphins, the Foana well to the left. A queer invasion party, even queerer when one totaled up the odds which might lie ahead. There was no mist or storm this morning to hide the headlands where the Foana citadel stood. And the promontories of the sea gate were starkly clear in the growing light. The same drive which always was a part of Ross when he was committed to action sustained him now, though he was visited by a small prick of doubt when he thought that the leadership did not lie with Ash but with the Foana. No warning of any trouble ahead as they passed between the mighty, sea-sunk bases of the gate pillars. Ross depended upon his sonic, but there was no adverse report from the sensitive recorder. The terrible chill of the water during the night attack had been dissipated, but here and there dead sea things floated, being torn and devoured by hunters of the waves. They were well past the pillars when Ross was aware that Lokith had changed place in the line, spurting ahead. After him went Baleku. They caught up with Karara, flashed past her. Ross looked to Ash, onto the Foana, but saw nothing to explain the action of the two Hawaikans. Then his sonic beat out a signal from Ash. Danger, follow the Foana, left. Karara had already changed course to head in that direction. Ahead of her, he could see Lokith and Baleku both still bound for the midpoint of the shore where the jetty and the sunken cutters were. Ash passed before him, and Ross reluctantly followed orders. A shelf of rock reached out from the cliff wall, under it a dark opening. The Foana sought this without hesitation, Ash, Karara, and Ross following. Moments later they were out of the water where footing sloped back and up. Below them Tino, Rao and Tawa nosed the rise, their heads lifting out of the water as they spoke. And Karara hastened to reply. Lokith. Baleku. Ross began when he caught a mental stroke of anger so deadly that it was a chill lance into his brain. He faced the Foana, startled and a little frightened. They will not come, now. A knob-crowned wand stretched out in the air, pointing to the upper reaches of the slope. Nor can any of their blood, unless we win. What is wrong? Ash asked. You were right, very right, men out of time. These invaders are not to be lightly dismissed. They have turned one of our own defenses against us. Lokith, Baleku, all of their kind, can be made into tools for a master. They belong to the enemy now. And we have failed so early, Karara wanted to know. Again that piercing thrust of anger so vivid that it was no mere emotion but seemed a tangible force. Failed? 
No. Not yet have we even begun to fight. You are very right. This is such an evil as must be faced and fought, even if we lose all in battle. Now we must do that which none of our own race has done for generations. We must open three locks, throw wide the great door, and seek out the keeper of the closed knowledge. Light, a sharp ray sighting from the tip of the wand, and the Foana following that beam, the three Terrans coming after, into the unknown. 